Hey you guys. So today we are going to discuss the somewhat tragic tale of John Lasseter. Now, John Lasseter, this is the father of Albert Hezekiah, the grandfather of Edward Cunningham Lasseter. Now, John Lasseter is born in 1796 in North Carolina. Now, he is the son of Hezekiah Lasseter. Now, I've heard Hezekiah Lasseter referred to as Hezekiah the Patriot Lasseter. But let me explain something. So when genealogists are doing their trees, they will often tag certain names with a shorthand so that when they're looking at their tree overall, they can see quickly who was the immigrant, who was the patriot, who fought in the American Revolution. And so um, what you'll often see in these trees that people have put together is they'll have their first guy, the first guy who crossed the ocean, he will be called the immigrant. Now, obviously, he wasn't called the immigrant in real life. He wasn't called, you know, Thomas the Immigrant Lassiter. This is just a, a name given 200 years later so that the genealogist knows who's who. Well, the same thing goes with the Patriots. So um, in a lot of family trees, you'll see, like, for example, in this one, you'll see Hezekiah the Patriot Lassiter. All that is, it's a shorthand for the genealogist to know that this guy fought in the American Revolution. It doesn't mean he's he was out there like, you know, Mel Gibson... And he was some big fighter in the American Revolution because actually Hezekiah Lasseter, while he did fight in the American Re Revolution, he his contribution to it was fairly small. Um, less than six months, not even enough to get him a pension. Um, but he did serve in the American Revolution. So that's Hezekiah Lasseter. Now his son, one of his many sons, is John Lasseter. Now John is born 1796 in North Carolina. Now, what's going on at this time is that shortly after this, so John's born in 1796. In 1803, Thomas Jefferson makes perhaps the greatest land deal, the, the best real estate deal in the history of time, and he, he does the Louisiana Purchase. <clears throat> you would think that Thomas Jefferson, his big contribution would have been the Declaration of Independence, but actually it's this Louisiana Purchase. So... Thomas Jefferson purchases from Napoleon, who's hard up for cash over in France. He purchases from Napoleon um, for $15 million. He buys 880,000 square miles. So that comes out to about three cents an acre. So he makes a really good deal. And Jefferson buys all this territory in the Louisiana Purchase uh, sight unseen. So it takes many years, you know, Jefferson has to, in the subsequent presidents, they have to send out uh, surveyors to survey this, all of this land and kind of break it apart into pieces. And so that takes many years. And um, it doesn't really become a territory of the U.S. as defined as such until 1819. That's how long it takes to get it surveyed and blocked off and you know we've got other things going on there's the war of 1812 that happens during this time now go going back to john lassiter john lassiter enlists in the army in 1813 so he's 17 or 18 at the time he enlists in gates county north carolina the description of him in his enlistment is he is 511 he's got blue eyes light brown hair a medium complexion and he lists his occupation as farmer, which was probably almost everybody's occupation. Um, <clears throat> he ends up fighting in the War of 1812 the whole time. I mean, that, that War of 1812 lasts until 1815. But um, we don't know much about his service, but we do know that when he gets out of the army, he's a colonel. So he must have, you know, he must have done well in the military. Uh, distinguished himself in some way. So um, he's a colonel. John Lasseter becomes a colonel. And after the war, sometime between 1824 and 1831, he marries a woman. Her name is Mary Parks. Now she is a widow of some guy Parks who died. I have spent countless hours trying to figure out who this Mary is. I don't know. Maybe somebody somewhere down the line will be able to use DNA and figure out who this Mary is, but I haven't been able to do it, and I have given up. So, um, he marries this widow Parks, and she has a daughter, Sarah Adeline, who's from this previous marriage. 
So uh, John eventually makes his way to Arkansas. Now I'm guessing that he is he does so because what the what the government would do at that time is anybody who serves in military service would typically be given a land bounty um, for their service. So my guess is that because he served in the War of 1812 and he was a soldier that the government then granted him a land bounty and it was probably in Arkansas, which is why we find John Lasseter out in Arkansas <clears throat> as early as 1826. And so we find him out there in 1826 and we know he's out there because he's selling assault works in Crawford County. So he's obviously been there before that if he's able to sell something. So, um, now, during this time, Arkansas is not yet a state. It's just a territory. And, um, but everybody can see that it's going to be a state. And so there's just a ton of land speculation going on. I mean, this is like a, it's, it's like a rush. Um, you, you know, you've got a lot of former military guys who have gotten land bounties out there. You've got everybody, you know, as you, as you study history, you start to be able to visually see the expansion of the United States, which starts just in this little rim and just and then starts really picking up speed in the 1800s. So there's a lot of land speculation going on in that area. And a lot of men would make their fortunes uh, during this time. So they're on the brink of statehood, right? Which would eventually occur in Arkansas in 1836. But so John Lasseter's out there and he is, he is building his life with his wife, Mary and her daughter, Ada. Ada. Now, they eventually have a son, Albert Hezekiah, who is Edward Cunningham Lassiter's father. Um, now, they're out there. They're in Arkansas. John Lassiter is, is a businessman and a politician, and his kind of business and political rival is a man named, unfortunately, he, he ends up with a rival, and this man's name is William Whitson. Now, John Lasseter runs against William Whitson for a Senate seat and beats him. Now, this election gets really ugly, and you can, <laughs> you can actually see these letters to each other in the paper where, you know, they're, Whitson accuses John Lasseter of stealing the election, lying, and all this other stuff. I don't know. It sounds like nonsense, to be honest. But, you know, here's a little... A little something from John Lasseter's letter to him in the newspaper. So, I pronounce you a base, envious, malicious slander and shall take no further notice of your false publications. So, this is from John Lasseter. Now, during one of the points of contention between these two guys was that at the time the county courthouse in uh, Van Buren, Arkansas, was in Whitson's general store. So, it's really in the best interest of Whitson to keep the county courthouse in his general store <laughs> because every time court's held in his general store, he gets to sell stuff, right? And Whitson's got his own property too. So he's trying to get things put on his property and same for John Lasseter. So um, Lasseter wants this courthouse moved out of this like general store and he wants a, a proper courthouse built. And, of course, he wants it out in an area where he's trying to develop and his friends are trying to develop. Now, I mean, at the time, John Lasseter's part of a newly formed Van Buren Fayetteville uh, turnpike company. And he's, he's in this company along with John Drennan, who would actually become a, a man of some importance in Arkansas later, and John Henry, a man named John Henry, and Edward Cunningham. Uh, you might recognize that name. So these are kind of his business partners at the time. They're all kind of early movers and shakers in that region of Arkansas as it's developing. Um, I'll come back to them later. But so John Lasseter wins that election in 1836 and he becomes this senator, gets it from Whitson. And Whitson's really upset about this. So John Lasseter's on his way to court to his set, this is December of 1836. John Lasseter's on his way to the courthouse, which is held in Whitson's general store, if you recall. He's on his way to the courthouse and he is pistol whipped from behind by Whitson. Now, the way I've always read the story as having gone is that Whitson pistol whips him and there's a scuffle that ensues and both men shoot each other in the chest 
and uh, Lassiter's The Better Shot and Wits and Dice. Well, now, recently, Albert has taught me about flintlock pistols, and I now realize that that's just, okay, I think that, so dueling was quite common back then, that a lot of political disputes were settled by duels. I mean, almost all dueling occurred over, you know, wives, some kind of affair, you know, it was an honor thing, and it happened a lot um, over political issues. So, I think what happened is John Lasseter goes into court. He is hit over the head because this is this seems to have been true. He's hit over the head by Whitson, who you know pistol whips him. And I think that what happens is they're like, "We're going down. We're we're going to have a duel right now." Because uh, I just think if they were in this scuffle, knowing what I know now about flintlock pistols and what Albert tells me, it seems like the balls would have fallen out, right? I mean, how are you going to scuffle around yet keep the ball up? Anyway, so. I think what happens is Whitson starts this fight and they end up having a duel. Uh, so both men get the shot off and uh, Lassiter's a better shot. They both get shot in the chest, but Lassiter's a better shot because Whitson dies 20 minutes later and Lassiter recovers from his wounds. And he is tried later uh, for manslaughter, but he's acquitted on the grounds of self-defense. So, and I think the reason the story's told in that way is probably dueling was frowned upon, legally frowned upon. So that's probably how it was written up, but I think it was probably a duel. So, the widow of Whitson, uh, the Whitson family feels like this great injustice has been done, and the widow ends up moving away back to Tennessee. But the son of Whitson, who's 17 at the time of his father's death, is... Uh, he stays. He stays in Van Buren. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what happens is two years after the death of his father, John Whitson, this is in 1838, um, John Whitson steps out from a hiding place and blasts John Lassiter with a shotgun filled with rifle balls. So, he just shoots him dead to avenge his father who John Lasseter killed two years before. So, um, and then he runs. I mean, a, a, an arrest warrant is issued for his arrest with a bounty of $1,000. Everybody assumes he's headed to Tennessee to his mother. Um, so, you know, they send out word to watch for him in, in Tennessee. And he does indeed go there to say goodbye to his mother. And he tells her that he's heading out west and she'll never see him again, which indeed she doesn't ever see, see him again. So you fast forward to 1997. Now there are two older women who are doing the genealogy of their Whitson family. Now these women had spent their whole lives hearing this story about this ancestor and the, you know, them him him killing John Lasseter and all this stuff. So uh, and that this this guy just this guy John Whitson kills Lasseter and disappears. So they decide to try and figure out where he went, what became of him. And they do. They find him. They find that he, after he kills John Lasseter, he goes, tells his mom goodbye. And um, he heads up northeast. He attends medical school in Maryland. He changes his name to Johnson. And he ends up dying out in San Jose, California at the age of 56 in a buggy accident. But he has this really successful career as a doctor in the meantime. His name at, at his death is Talaferro David Johnson totally made up out of whole cloth. Um, <clears throat> but so these, these Whitson descendant ladies who find him also contact Dale. Now this was a few years ago. So they contact Dale. So um, they go to Colorado, they meet with Dale. Dale's a totally gracious. He um, takes them around Colorado. He takes them to the, you know, Garden of the Gods. And anyway, uh, it's kind of, later they would make newspaper articles about it. And um, <clears throat> it's kind of written about, like, portrayed as these two families coming back together uh, in peace. And anyway, um, it's nice, you know, this, these two families sort of coming back together to forgive one another. So, now we go back to Lassiter, who is only 42 when he's murdered. And I think he was on the cusp of doing some amazing things. I mean, I, I really think he was. So he's 42 when this guy Whitson murders him. And um, 
He's got a small son. You know, I think that, yeah, Albert Hezekiah is like seven. Yeah, he's seven when his father's murdered. And um, maybe John Lasseter knew that he, he must have had a sense or had some reason to believe it, it, it might be coming because he writes his will like one week before Whitson kills him. And you wonder to yourself, why? Why did Whitson wait two years to kill John Lasseter? Well, one thought is that Whitson's brother-in-law was sheriff at the time. And uh, there is a belief that maybe he waited for his brother-in-law to finish out his term as sheriff so that his brother-in-law wouldn't be hunting him down. Because that's what happens. He waits for his, right after the brother-in-law finishes his term of sheriff. That's when, that's when Whitson kills John Lasseter. So, so the son, Albert Hezekiah Lasseter, loses his father at the age of seven. His mother, Mary, who has now lost two husbands um, in, short, in a short span of time, um, she dies four years later. Now, I think it's odd that we don't ever hear about them. Albert Lasseter, Albert Hezekiah, he never talks about, he ends up never really talking about his parents. He doesn't talk about John, he doesn't talk about his mother. Um, not that Dale can remember anyway, or that Dale puts in, in the Falfurious book. So, um, I don't know. I wonder if, I, I just wonder if she wasn't just consumed in grief or something. We have no idea why she dies four years later. Anyway, so we know that uh, Albert Hezekiah has a half-sister named Sarah Adeline. And he ends up being raised by Sarah Adeline, and he just loves Ada. And he ends up naming a daughter Ada after, after his sister. So Ada is married to a man named John Henry. And now John Henry was a business partner of John Lasseter. And in fact, John Henry marries Ada, Ada in, the, in the house of John Lasseter before he's murdered. So John Henry and Ada Henry raise Albert Hezekiah Lasseter. Now, John Henry is business partners uh, with a man named Edward Cunningham. Now, John Henry and Edward Cunningham own a, own a mercantile business, a wholesale mercantile business, and they have interests in a steamboat and a shipping company. Um, so they're quite, they're, they're wholesalers, they're grocery wholesalers. And it sounds like they're doing really well. Their firm is called Henry and Cunningham. So... So this is how this is how you see the Cunningham Lasseter connection because Albert Hezekiah Lasseter is raised by John Henry, who is business partners with Edward Cunningham. So John or so Albert Hezekiah Lasseter comes up as a youth. He comes up alongside Edward and Thomas Cunningham, who are the sons of Edward Cunningham, and a woman and a girl named Sarah Jane Cunningham. Now Sarah Jane Cunningham is the one that Albert Hezekiah ends up marrying. There's the connection with the Cunningham family. So um, Albert's raised by John Henry. Edward Cunningham, the senior, um, he ends up dying fairly young at the age of 1851. But Albert, who marries Sarah Jane Cunningham, he, he ends up, you know, side by side with these Cunningham brothers um, where they all go to Texas. So, okay.